Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending my talk today and welcome indeed to this year's virtual conference. My name is James Freeman and today I'm going to be taking you through digital t twinning for infrastructure testing. Now, destructive infrastructure testing. In fact, you'll notice that the title on the agenda is somewhat longer than the title on my title slide. And indeed, there is a reason for that. It's very much a case of I couldn't fit my title on the title slide, not without making the font tiny. But we'll get to all of that in just a moment. Before we do, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. For those of you who are watching this live at the conference, I will be on the virtual chat facility. So do feel free to engage me. Any questions you want to ask, please do ask as we go through the presentation. And otherwise, my social media links are down the bottom here. You'll see them again at the end of the slide deck. So if anybody is watching this on a replay or thinks of a question five minutes after the presentation, which is what I normally do, please do reach out to me. Be so happy to hear from you and engage. Now, who am I? That great existential question. I am a consultant at a little bespoke technology provider called A24, originally headquartered in Tokyo, where this conference should have been held this year, were it not for a pandemic, and based mostly in the UK, where I help um, a lot of businesses, all sizes, big and small, implement their open source technology needs. Now, on top of that, I run my own little empowerment coaching practice. I am a Reiki master teacher. I am a father to two wonderful boys on the autistic spectrum. And my roots take me back to and being an electronic engineer. I've always been around technology, probably the last 20 years or so, but it didn't start off in open source and software. It started off very much behind a soldering iron and a CAD program and designing circuit boards and that kind of thing. So I'm never happier than when I am putting things together, inventing things, repairing things, that kind of thing. I am also a big fan of GTD, of David Allen's Getting Things Organized, and you will see a flavor of that as we go through today. Indeed, there is a reason, a sort of methodology behind today's story, how it evolved and what I'm going to share with you. And last but not least, you will notice uh, a little bit of a bias, I must admit, towards Ansible throughout the presentation. I have got three books published with Ansible, so I'm afraid, full disclosure, my bias is definitely going to be towards Ansible whenever I have something to automate, particularly in the open source space. So please forgive me that. As I say, I hope you enjoy the presentation and let me take you on a bit of a story. So with homage to the classic joke about the horse and the bartender says, why the long face? Why the long title so big that it wouldn't even fit on the title slide? And Ultimately, I suppose when you're pitching for an agenda, a spot at a conference, I wanted to be descriptive. I wanted to put out there exactly what it is that I was going to convey. And Ansible is a big thing. Again, we'll touch on that a little bit later. And I wanted to really sort of put out there what it was I was going to talk about, but also the why. And the real reason behind all of this is not just for infrastructure testing, but the ability to do things that normally you would think about doing twice if you um you know if you'd spent hours building a physical a really nice shiny well-built production infrastructure and then you went and sort of blew it up you would normally think twice about that however there is a concept i want to talk about today which i think lends itself very much to testing those use cases to testing those scenarios that we don't normally think about the kind of things what that people say oh that shouldn't happen so let me tell you a story and let me tell you how I solved it and all about how we can get to destructive infrastructure testing through this thing called digital twinning. So like all good technology stories, this started with a simple request and you can decide as we go through this whether I overcomplicated the answer. That's a completely different point. The CEO says to me, build me OpenStack and a really nice, tightly bounded request. However, OpenStack is one of those things that it's really easy to build a sort of all in one single node deployment, which is great for kicking the tires, learning about how it's installed, at least on a single node basis, what services are running. I've done it a number of times, working examples for potential clients for one of the books that I mentioned, even for a professional certification exam. 
the whole model of the all in one node for me falls down when it comes to doing this for a production kind of environment. And indeed, we were looking at this in a production context. And when you want to actually learn a technology for a production environment, it's so important to know what the weak points are, how to deal with scenarios when they come up. So what happens if one of our switches falls off the network? What happens if this particular node dies? How do we recover from that scenario, that kind of thing? Indeed, what happens if someone fires off a denial of service attack against us? And so this for me, I'm no OpenStack expert, again, full transparency on that one. What I really wanted to do from this exercise, however, was to really learn OpenStack and not just on a level of, I built an all-in-one node, but how to deploy it in a production kind of architecture so that we as a business could learn from it and grow and move forward. And having thought all this through quite carefully and decided what I wanted to do, I was presented with my constraints, which was here's a single blade to build it on and it has mechanical storage and little sort of spoiler towards the end of the presentation, don't use mechanical storage, but that's, that's a bit of a separate point. So digital twinning, first of all, if you've not come across this concept before, it was according to the law of the internet, at least something that evolved at NASA. And it started out with the very first space capsule. So if you're building and designing a space capsule and you want to know if it's going to work, if the astronauts are going to be able to sit in it, whether they're going to be able to interface with the control panel, reach the buttons, all, all those sort of fundamental basics of designing, I suppose, what would be a, a, a user interface of sorts, you need a mock-up. And so NASA built actual life-size models of the space capsules before they built the real thing to make sure that they got the design right. Now this obviously was very early on before all the technology and computers that we take for granted today and it's something that evolved into computer modeling, computer simulation. And so this concept of building models, of, of twinning, the sort of physical twin morphed into the concept of the digital twin that being a digital representation of a real thing. Now, obviously, that's mentioned it with respect to, to space travel and that field, but really it's a concept that can be used anywhere. It, it's a high-level concept that says we're going to make a model, an accurate representation of this system, this design, this whatever it is, really. And so having discovered that this very thing existed and that I wanted to, to learn OpenStack properly from an architectural point of view, not just from a, a single all-in-one node point of view, I decided to set about building my own digital twin. So bear in mind, I only had one blade, but I wanted to build something that was an accurate representation of a production OpenStack deployment. Even if it was a small one, at least I wanted to be able to say, it's got high availability, I can take nodes out of service and it keeps going. Now, the next piece of the title with Ansible and Cloud in it. So I've built OpenStack a few times, as I mentioned, in the single all-in-one node context. And I've learned the hard way that I'm not an expert and I'm probably not going to get it right first time. And when you don't know a technology and you're getting going for the first time and particularly when time is of the essence as well there are times when it's actually easier to rebuild to go i got that wrong i messed that up for whatever reason maybe i didn't understand the configuration maybe i was just testing something and i wanted to to take a look at it from that angle and then try something out Ultimately, it can be easier to just rebuild parts of the infrastructure or indeed the whole thing than it can be to have to pick through configurations to fix things, to reconfigure bits and pieces. So I'm thinking really here, and I put on the slide Docker-like behavior. So I'm thinking of this concept where we, we don't treat images, virtual architectures like, like pets, we treat them like kettle to use the classic analogy. We, when something doesn't serve us, we simply build a new one because it's quick and because it's easy. But although I think this was a fair hypothesis, I knew that I didn't want to spend my time doing menial tasks like for example, building Linux servers from an ISO. So booting from the ISO 
clicking through the installer, setting the initial IP address, setting a username and password, bonding, so on and so forth. And particularly if you think I was going to build a sort of virtual architecture with perhaps 10 nodes in it, and this was something I was anticipating doing more than once. So I did not want to end up doing all those, even the basic steps over and over again, because it would be a massive waste of time that could be spent learning the technology and doing something more constructive. So it was sort of immediately apparent to me that, okay, I'm going to need some sort of automation stack, some sort of software that's going to automate the deployment process. So first of all, why Ansible? So I've been fairly upfront about this. Yes, a huge amount of familiarity with it. And I was looking around the internet, a bit of research for this and other presentations I've done recently. There's a link at the bottom of this slide that you can go check out if you wish, but Ansible has really boomed in popularity over the last few years. It's really sort of come almost out of nowhere, it feels like, and it's sort of accelerated beyond so many of the sort of chef and puppet installations, just as two examples that were really quite well established in the market. Now, I work quite a lot with Ansible in the field, so not just as, a, as an abstract concept in a book, but actually in real world scenarios. And I, I think two of the reasons that it's, it's gained such traction is first of all, that it's agentless. That's one of the really big factors in that decision. It's something where from a corporate point of view, you don't have to roll out a new agent amongst the hundred other agents that you're probably managing for endpoint protection and, and, and and it uses the native transport. So it uses SSH, which is so important in scenarios like Linux because you've got SSH already embedded and in switch configuration, because if you're de configuring network devices, those devices have in certainly in 2020, they've almost certainly got an SSH interface to them, which is, is just brilliant. It just lends itself to Ansible so very well. Beyond that, Ansible is idempotent. That, wonderful words that you hear around automation circles that basically means if I write a playbook and admittedly write it well because you can write a bad playbook just as you can with any other form of code then you should be able to run it once twice a hundred times against the same infrastructure and always end up with the same state at the end of it so it really doesn't matter if you run it over the top of a previous run in fact you should be able to break one thing and then rerun the playbook and it puts it back how it was. That is the whole concept of being idempotent. It's basically saying my servers have a nice steady state and Ansible is going to put them in that state. And if they ever leave that state, you can put them back into that state with Ansible. One of the other things I really love about Ansible is the code is often described by self doc uh, by or even as self-documenting. And that's a term that I've picked up with that I believe to be very much true. I think that Ansible code is, is quite easy to read. There's a few bits of it, but I think that to go from zero with Ansible to meaningful automation is a relatively rapid journey. And if someone else gives you a playbook or a role or something like that, it's normally quite easy to pick it up. And even if you don't really know the language to go, okay, I kind of understand what that's doing, at least I've got an idea and I can go away and do a bit of research, do a bit of searching on the internet and figure it all out. Now, of course, when you're automating any set of tasks, sooner or later, you're going to come across secrets, passwords, that kind of thing. And deploying OpenStack is no exception to that. OpenStack has secrets, passwords, that kind of thing that are necessary for configuring it, for, for initial login, for services to communicate with each other and that kind of thing. And again, Ansible has built in support for that in the form of Ansible Vault. So Ansible Vault essentially encrypts sensitive data like passwords at rest, but you can use them in playbooks as if they were unencrypted. So brilliant addition to any automation technology. To me, Ansible was just a really natural fit for this. And beyond that, there is the wonderful OpenStack Ansible project. So not only was I going to do my sort of basic bring up and configuration as far as possible with Ansible, there is, as I mentioned, a really wonderful project called OpenStack-Ansible. It's available on GitHub. 
is well staffed. I spent quite a bit of time on their IRC channel with, and they helped me out loads whilst I was working on this project. And so just logically in my head, it was like very much, well, if we're in a state where OpenStack itself is deployed with Ansible, then there's no point me bringing up the rest of the environment with some other automation technology. I want to reduce this to a nice, simple level where I'm using as few technologies as possible, but really picking the right ones. So Ansible for me was a very, very natural fit here. Now, why cloud in it? How has cloud in it snuck into this arena? Well, Ansible's really, really great when you've brought up your infrastructure. So your VMs have booted up, they've got that initial username and password, or it could be SSH key for login, but they've got that initial authentication mechanism. They've got that initial IP address and a little, little sort of teaser there as well. You also need Python installed. So I mentioned that Ansible is agentless. It is indeed. It does, however, expect Python to be installed on the virtual machines or indeed physical machines that it's automating. Now, most modern Linux distributions do feature Python, which is why this is a fairly reasonable assumption for Ansible to make. But some of the really minimal cloud images that you might come across for Linux from some of the vendors, they don't have Python built in. It's not included simply to keep the image really light and really compact. And that's obviously great from a space saving point of view. It's a real pain if you want to automate with Ansible because your first step is potentially worst case scenario, to manually have to deploy Python across all your nodes. And that's really something that you don't want to have to do. Now, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, to bring up blank Linux images and configure them with usernames, passwords, IPs, even put Python on, none of it is rocket science, none of it is difficult, but what it is if you have to do it at scale and if you have to do it over and over again, and remember my hypothesis, I'm probably not going to get this right, not even on the 10th try, never mind the first one. The last thing you want is to be doing this repetitively at scale. Cloudinit is something that is baked in to most of the Linux cloud images you will find out there. In fact, if you have experienced Linux on any of the major cloud providers and not picking on any particular names, but you know, the, the, the big ones off the top of my head, like Azure and AWS, for example, the initial bring up of those is almost always conf the machines are configured with cloud in it. Cloud in it is used within OpenStack itself to configure the VMs, again, to configure the initial login and their initial IP address. So they mean that you can have really clean VM images with no metadata and they download everything they need from this cloud in it service from a known URL or provider source. Now, even when you install Ubuntu server from the ISO, so you might install it on a physical piece of tin, but when you install it, if you have a poke about in the system and look at how it's configured, how it's set the IP address and all that kind of thing, it's actually configured with cloud in it. So what Canonical have done with their Ubuntu distribution is they've said cloud in it is kind of here, let's put it in across the board, even when you're not using the cloud because that way our builds are consistent. And I think that's a really great idea. And cloud in it, as well as working with, as the name implies, cloud platforms, it also works really well with local platforms. And one of the ways you can get data into cloud in it is from an ISO images. Now, ISOs, physical optical disks are obviously going the way of the dodo. In fact, I think they've kind of already done that in 2020. But attaching an ISO image to a virtual machine is something that's still commonplace, easy to do, well supported. And so this is a really great way when you're working with virtual machines to get cloud in it data in, even if you're not using a public or private cloud platform. And cloud in it, I've seen it do a lot of the basics. The here's a static IP address, here's your DNS servers, here is the initial username and password of someone who's going to log in. What I learned as part of this that I, I just hadn't appreciated about cloud in it as a technology is that it can actually do the full bring up. It can configure the bonding, it can configure SSH keys, it can run arbitrary commands. So if you've got a cloud image without Python installed, it can do, if you're using Ubuntu, which I ended up using, you can do apt get install Python as part of the initial bring up, as well as all the network and everything else. 
So cloud in it for me works really well hand in hand with Ansible. And I think there's obviously there's some overlap between the tools because you could do initial scripts in cloud in it that do all the bring up that you want to do. But what I did was I drew a line in the sand as, as one does. And I said, I want cloud in it to be responsible of, for just enough configuration that the VM stands up by itself. And then I'm going to let Ansible take over and do all the heavy lifting. There's no right or wrong in doing more with cloud in it. It's just a case of drawing your own line in the sand and working out where that's going to be for you, where you think that's going to work best. Now, hardware. I had one blade for this task, and it was fairly apparent to me that in spite of my burning desire to build something that looked like a highly available production OpenStack architecture, that I wasn't going to get a hand, you know, a handful of switches, a handful of blades or pizza boxes or whatever it was to build it on. And so I, it was like, okay, fine. I think it's pretty plain to see that I'm going to need a hypervisor to achieve this. And I work in the open source space, so it needs to be free and free as in open source, free as in GPL or something appropriately licensed. Fast is obviously important because of the amount. If you imagine I was going to try and put 10 nodes on one box, doing a fair amount of work, it's got to be fast. I don't want it to be a heavyweight, cumbersome emulation layer. It needs to be flexible. And bearing in mind that OpenStack obviously is its own virtualization solution outright, it needs to support nested virtualization. I need to be able to pass those CPU, CPU flags through to the VMs so that they can do nested virtualization. Ideally, you know, we all know that nested virtualization is not going to be fast, but at least it would allow me to get the functionality up and running. And spoiler, the CPU support for nested virtualization was there. So that was one battle I didn't have to fight. Now, Linux kernel virtualization just seemed like the absolute perfect fit for me. It's just there on just about any modern Linux that you install. It's free. It's lightweight. It works. I know it supports nested virtualization because I've done it. So a bit like Ansible for me fell into place as the cloud in it as natural choices. The, um, the libvirt and the Linux kernel virtualization just fell into place as the natural choice for this to work with. So what about the switching? We've talked at length about bringing up infrastructure, about multiple nodes, about really bringing up the whole thing. What about the switching? Now, for me, I needed something that I could virtualize. So something that I could run on KVM, something that was modern, something that was fast, but also importantly, something that was free because I, I'm sure most people know you can run things like Cisco switches emulated on tools out there. However, there is a legal question mark over downloading those ROM images and running it. So I didn't want to fall into that gray area. I wanted to choose something that was genuinely free and legitimate to use in this context. And the answer came to me in the form of Cumulus Networks, who, since I started all this work, have been acquired by NVIDIA but they produce a, a Linux distribution called Cumulus Linux that runs on white box switching hardware. So we're talking sort of 130 plus platforms at this time. And when you log into it, it looks a lot like Debian. You can use all your Linux schools to manage it, but yet it's a fully featured switch management platform, which is absolutely fantastic. And they very kindly release a tool set called Cumulus VX, which you can run in just about any hypervisor. So that was like, fantastic. I can download Cumulus VX and I can configure a modern sort of switching, high availability switching architecture within my chosen hypervisor. And I can have not just redundancy at the OpenStack layer, but redundancy at the switching layer as well. Now, this is all great. Lots of decisions made, lots of planning put in place. The thing is, I am very visual in the nature and the way that I learn and the way I process things. I knew that if I tried to build something of the order of 10 Linux nodes with five switches, so this is sort of leaf and spine switching with um, a, an out of band management switch, my brain was going to melt if I tried to wire that up using uh, you know, tap adapters, bridging, linking ports within XML files for libvert, that kind of thing. 
And bearing in mind that, again, I was going to follow, I decided at this point, I was going to follow a reference design from the OpenStack Ansible project. This is where the 10 nodes come from. And so I was going to be using VXLAN. I was going to have two physical networks because obviously you don't want to be using bandwidth for storage and then have people competing for that bandwidth for their actual functional applications. There will be VLANs on top of those physical networks. It was just my brain was absolutely going to melt if I tried to implement this all in flat text files. So I wanted to commit sort of the ultimate heresy of the open source space and have a GUI for this. I, uh, Cumulus Networks, if anyone's interested, on their GitHub site, they have some great tools for developing um, architectures for wiring up large networks. I think it's based on Vagrant, if memory serves. Do go and investigate that if you, if you are so inclined and you do want to do this in text mode. But for me, I wanted a GUI, and I'm not ashamed to admit that here today. Now... Oh, my mention of heresy came about in the form of GNS3, and I had heard about this a number of times in my career, dabbled with it a number of times, this sort of come across it in the context of, I wonder if I, it's worth me getting a CCNA, learning some more about switching and so on. But it turns out, where I pulled out GNS3 because I liked the GUI on it, and as I started to poke about, what I realized was that under the hood, GNS3 is quite interesting in the way it works it uses Linux kernel virtualization. It's designed to support cloud images. So you can download your Ubuntu cloud image or your Cumulus VX cloud image and run it almost straight off in GNS3. You can mount ISO images easily, which means we can get our cloud init data from that ISO. And there's all, you know, you can do all the stuff that you'd expect to be able to do on the command line with libvirt. So you can manipulate the backing images, they're standard QCOW2 based images, so you can use libguestfs, you can use qemu-image to manipulate them, inject files, that kind of thing. You can add any command line switches to the qemu binary for running it, so that's how you can get your nested virtualization turned on. Essentially, it wasn't designed this way, but it's a really great interface to Linux, um, Linux's built-in kernel hypervisor. And it's free, it's open source, and it has a GUI. Now this here was the end results for anybody who wants to know what it all looked like, albeit it's powered off in this screenshot wired up. Now, unfortunately getting this in and doing a live demo isn't possible in the time that we've got, but this is what it looks like. Now, I think you'll agree, it would probably benefit a little bit from some orthogonal lines, something like that. But the great thing about this for me was that each of those network links, you can drag any of the nodes around to make that easier to see. I've kind of squished it up a little bit so it would all fit on the one screenshot there. But you can right click on any of those links, you can take them away, you can sniff the traffic on them to see what's going on. So you get this really great tool to play with the network and see what's going on and to manipulate it if the need arises. And each node you can right click on, you can power it on, power it off, get into the terminal of it. It's a really great way to, to remove the headache, the brain ache of trying to manage an architecture like this when you virtualized it all on one piece of tin. Now the end result was you know, bypassing a lot of story and a lot of swearing and everything else that it all worked and it really did actually produce a real working representation of something that you might put together in the real world for OpenStack. And I think that was great. And the great thing for me was it was all deployed with Ansible and Cloud in it. So the whole point of that was this is something that you could do again and again. Now, drilling down into that, you know, obviously that's that's a fairly quick statement. What does that actually mean? Well, the GNS3 environment is completely isolated from the rest of your network. The playbooks and the cloud init scripts that were written could be used to bring up a real world, um, you know, installation architecture of OpenStack on physical tin. You could even replicate MAC addresses if you wanted to and IP addresses that you would use in production in GNS3. Because the networks are isolated, they're not going to overlap. So you could test every aspect of this. It is a complete digital twin. And the beauty of it is, as I say, because you can twin absolutely everything, you can literally develop and test your Ansible and your cloud init scripts and playbooks and what have you in GNS3, and then use exactly the same ones on a, you know, a rack full of hardware and hopefully get the same results. 
So it's not just useful for actually testing and learning about the architecture, it's useful for testing and learning about the automation process too. Now this process can be applied to just about any technology. So this was quite an ambitious starting point with OpenStack, but I've since used this to build any number of demo environments for clients, proof of concepts, training environments, that kind of thing. I have found it's been really valuable and I've tweaked and enhanced the scripts, the cloud init build environment and things that I used on this initially. It makes a really great training tool. And because it's got that visual appeal, it's particularly good when I'm working to do pre-sales work as a consultant, I can use it to show people visually the kind of network that we're looking at to build a solution. And then I can drill down into it, actually run it, get onto the console of boxes or get onto web interfaces and show them how it all works. So it's got this massive application for simulating real world architectures because very little in 2020 lives on one server or one box. Almost everything that we're going to deploy, particularly in a production context, needs to be high availability. It needs more than one node. It needs some form of replication or HA or something. But what else can we do? The, you know, this by itself for me has been massively valuable. But what about if we actually get down into the process of breaking something? Let's do something fun. Let's do something destructive. Now, here's some ideas that I came up with. I've, I've had time to try a few of these. The list isn't exhaustive, but this is to give you an idea of the kind of thing that you could do. And bear in mind, if you'd actually built this on physical hardware, configured every node by hand, you know, got in there, configured the bonding, configured the switches, spent time installing everything, you would be really, really upset if someone came along and said, I want to try this attack on your network. It's probably going to break it, but can we try it? Because it would be like, no, it's going to take me hours to rebuild it. But the thing with the GNS3 based digital twin is you can pull individual network links, just take them down and see what happens. You can pull entire switches. You can just literally pull the plug on a switch and see if track if it still roots. So I'd put in place a little sort of spine and leaf network architecture there that I took from a reference design I found from Cumulus Linux's application sheets. And that's great. You can take one switch out from each tier and the traffic still roots. You know, you, you'd almost, you wouldn't go to the data center. You wouldn't drive to the data center, get the pass, get in, get through all the security and start pulling plugs on things to see what would happen. But you can do that in this environment. You can turn nodes off. You can launch denial of service attacks, brute force attacks. Imagine getting in there with a Kali Linux VM and doing all sorts of nefarious stuff to it. The other great thing is business continuity. You could literally back this environment up. So test whatever your process is to back up the, let's say in the OpenStack world, the, the MariaDB database that holds all the config data to back up all the user data that Glance and Cinder and those kind of services are referencing. You could back them up, destroy the environment, and then test your resource door processes all easily in a completely isolated environment without affecting anyone else and without sort of the risk to any customer data, anything like that. So it's really, really valuable for testing out how you're going to deal with situations that just we, we spend a lot of time putting things together that, in the hope that something doesn't happen. Like, you know, a raid controller blows up that completely through some weird modus operandi destroys the whole array. That just shouldn't happen. Right. But, you know, on the very edge cases, it does. And how do you deal with that? Do you even know if your backups work? Have you tested a restore? As, as people have said to me, your backups are no good unless you've had a successful restore of them. But the great thing is you can do all of this. You can do all of this destructive work, but you can back the whole thing up. At the end of the day, it's a JSON file that describes the GNS3 environment and a bunch of um, literally QCOW2 image files. So you could create a tarball of it. And if you don't even want to go to that length, GNS3 actually supports snapshots. It has a snapshot functionality very much like you'd find in any other desktop hypervisor. So you can create a snapshot and you get to blow it up more than once. So not like the building where it's like it's come down and that's it. Now I've got to spend weeks, months, whatever it is, metaphorically or otherwise rebuilding it. You can literally do something evil, blow it up, and then within a matter of minutes, put it back exactly how it was at the beginning and do it all over again. And maybe I'm getting too much into this. Maybe it's too much fun for me. But anyway, 
that I think just has huge possibilities for training purposes, for business continuity planning, and for destructive testing, for security testing. Now, a quick worked example as we, we come towards the end of the presentation, we've got three OSD nodes in a Ceph cluster as part of this OpenStack Ansible setup. And all of them have one dedicated data disk. So very, very simple here. You'd obviously have something a bit more in production, but this is what I created. We could pull a plug on a node as a starting point. Now, because we've got three nodes, my hope would be if I've configured it right, everything keeps running. The, the, the Ceph cluster can deal with the loss of one node. The data is still accessible, albeit it's maybe being rebuilt on the fly or something like that is happening. But it lets us actually test this. You know, you would never do this while your customers were using an environment. Now, assuming that you get that far and that all works as you wanted it to, you could then actually go in and you could do something really bad to the data disk. So for example, we know it's a flat file, it's a QCOW2 image. You could use DD to copy from dev random to that QCOW2 image. Again, you'd never do something like that in a production environment and probably not even in a testing environment just because of how long it would take to put it back together if something didn't work in terms of your recovery process. But you could completely destroy that disk, bring the node back into service, see what happens, see how the cluster behaves. Does it start serving garbage? Does it keep sane? And then assuming it does what you hoped it do, document the procedures, even then test your recovery, your rebuild processes, and get the node back into services. So it provides a complete disaster recovery training sort of sandbox environment, which I just think is absolutely fantastic. As I say, it's something I've worked big and small companies for, for sort of, as I say, almost 20 years now in this field. And most of them never have a test environment that's quite the same scale as production to do this sort of destructive work in. Now, obviously, there are some limitations to this. I'm sure people will have spotted some of these already. It's, it is being virtualized. It's not going to be as fast as real hardware, particularly when you come to nested virtualization. And there is some hardware specific stuff that you can't do. So being able to virtualize the switch layer has been fantastic. But if you're using anything other than Ethernet, so if you're using fiber channel, something low latency, if you've got specific RAID configurations for drives that you want to test out, that kind of thing you're not going to be able to do effectively in the, in the virtualized digital twin. And you're not going to do this on a standard laptop as well. You, you just, the poor thing, you'd bring it to its knees. So you do need to throw tin at this for sure to get it off the ground and working well for you. Now, a few things as we come to the end of this presentation that I learned from the experience. Now, it goes without saying, it's why we're having this conference here, but the Linux community is absolutely amazing. I had so much great support on IRC channels, particularly from the, everyone at o, the OpenStack Ansible project. They were so helpful in getting this up and running. Do throw hardware at this. I, in the end, I purchased a used workstation for this with two Xeon chips in it, and I put a big SSD in it. And, you know, don't attempt this on mechanical storage. Do throw RAM at it. Do throw CPU cores at it. It will help enormously. And do use VertIO for the disks and the networking. I started off using emulated E1000 NICs and emulated IDE for the disks. And it works. It's functional. It's absolutely fine until you start to push it. And then you realize how slow that emulated layer is. And as it's all an environment like the one I built is all Linux based. There's no reason not to use VertIO. It's all supported natively. And the, the other thing that I learned the hard way, I started this on a high powered Windows workstation because it was all I had to hand initially before I bought the one that I actually built it on. Don't do this on anything other than Linux. If you do it on say a Windows or a Mac, GNS3 runs its whole virtualization layer in a VM on that OS. So you're already nesting virtualization before you get anywhere. So if you want to do nested virtualization, you're doing nested inside nested. It's just like, no, don't do it. It's going to be a world of pain. Please don't go there. Now, moving forwards, I've built a whole suite of lab environments in this manner. Um, Red Hat virtualization, uh, Catello, Ansible Tower, you, you name it. I've built sort of infrastructures, nice little tightly defined infrastructures that I can test, that I can figure out configurations on. It, and it, the great thing is the link to GTD at the beginning of the presentation, 
it documents all the build steps and all the configuration because it's all there in the cloud in it and the Ansible file. So I don't have to remember how to do all this stuff. I can look at my playbooks and refer back to how I got it all working originally. This has been used, as I mentioned earlier, extensively for demos to customers, clients, that kind of thing. And I use it for my own needs. I use it to help myself learn new technologies and get to grips with that kind of thing. And my hope is that by sharing this with everyone today, perhaps we can all learn a bit more about technologies, particularly distributed, highly available ones, as are so common these days, using these kind of techniques. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, very happy to take questions either now at any point in this conference or if this is over, please do reach out to me on social media. We'd love to discuss this further with you. And with that, just want to say, Again, here are my contact details. If you want the code that was used to bring up the environment that you saw on the screenshot earlier, it is publicly available on my GitHub account. Please do go and have a look. It's, it's been refined a little bit since the version that's out there, but please do have a look at it. And again, if you hit any issues with it, if you want to talk more about it or the concepts, please do get in touch. Thank you very much for your time today. I hope this has been valuable and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.